so here we are today. Um, a pretty cool January 2023 day. Um, but we have a, a wonderful guest with us today. Um, we have Celian Trudel, who is a speech and language language pathologist and an outdoor ed consultant. Um, and she has a great uh, workshop that she's going to talk to us about today, um, revolving around journaling in nature, which I am so excited about. So jur nature journaling, a tool to learn and wonder. So a very um, hands-on approach and very student-oriented approach to um, getting kids journaling what they're doing outside. So thanks so much for, for joining us today, everyone. And um, Celian, thank you for coming in and hopping on and, uh, and sh talking to us a little bit about the things that we love, nature and journaling. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so yeah, I titled my... Um... My presentation a tool to, nature journaling a tool to learn and wonder uh because i really feel it's a great to, tool to learn and wonder and actually to learn how to learn for students um i do nature journaling myself uh i love it i've i've always been doing it so you know but uh, i i didn't know it was called nature journaling so i learned that uh you know a couple of years ago and then I started doing it with the students and it's it works wonder in my opinion <laughs> so I'm really excited to present you um, on this topic so my name is Celiane Trudel uh, I'm a speech language pathologist uh, but I also have a specialized graduate diplomas in nature and adventure-based intervention that I took at UCAC in Chicoutimi um, I've been working in EUHT since 2016. Uh, EUHT is the Cree territory of the James Bay area in Quebec. You can see it's on the on the like uh, mid yellow <laughs> portion of the map. Um, so these are the Cree communities that I'm working with. Um, I love it. <laughs> I absolutely lo love working there. Um, Arts, drama, and nature always gave meaning to my life. And uh, as a speech language pathologist, I've always um, wanted to include it in my practice. I've all actually always included it in my practice because I feel it's really important. Like it was really important for me. And I think it's important for all students to be able to experience those things um, throughout their, uh, their, their life, actually. <laughs> So today's plan, uh, I'm going to start by defining what is nature journaling. I'm going to talk about the research a little bit, uh, mostly about the benefits of, of nature journaling on students. Um, of course, I'm going to spend a whole chunk of this presentation on nature journaling in action. So the logistics, what do you need to know? Uh, so you can actually go outside and do it with your students. I want this to be really practical. Um, and then we're going to make some links with learning goals. So I, throughout this presentation, I invite you to sort of think about what you are currently teaching to your students and how nature journaling could uh, be linked with those learning goals. So at the, towards the end of the presentation, you can maybe share a little bit, uh, maybe in the chat or uh, in the audio or video <laughs> portion. Um, and then I'm going to also share some resources to help you uh, go further in nature journaling. So this on the picture on the right, it's one of my journal page that I made on a, quite a weird flower that I found in uh, nature right behind my house. Uh, it looks like a ghost flower. So I really liked it. it made me curious and wanted to learn more about it. So my definition of nature journaling is the process of taking notes on things that you feel, see, hear, think, and wonder about nature by using words, drawings, and numbers. So from my perspective, I think you can nature journal if you can nature journal even if you're inside. But if you only do that, you're missing a whole part of the experience. So I really encourage you to go outside. Uh, even I would uh, suggest that you start nature and journaling outside with your students uh, and then bring it in, inside. I think that's a, a better progression than the opposite. You're going to have more engagement and more uh, curiosity from your students. But that page that you see below is one of mine. 
uh, also uh, this I made inside because I, I just wanted to have um, to learn more about this family of animals because in my uh, area uh, I hear a lot about fishers uh, attacking cats and then <laughs> when I go up north I hear more about different animals like the marten, the wolverine, uh, the otter. So I just wanted to have like perspective of what is this family of animals and I made a page about it but I had to consult books and you know google to do it so I was inside doing it. So that's a different way of nature journaling. But we're going to talk mostly about nature journaling outside today. So research shows that nature journaling is a tool for children's learning through drawing, writing, science, and art to develop observational, observational skills, deepen nature exploration, increase knowledge of their local environment, and grow a deeper relationship with nature. That's from a research by WHO in 2022. And on the right, you can see um, another table from an, other, another research by Bollock in 2023. And it lists the effects on adolescence of nature journaling, but in my opinion, it also applies <laughs> to uh, elementary students. Um, so I just highlighted the, uh, some of them, uh, like you can see the first category is educational effects. So improving figurative language skills, uh, fostering curiosity, improving observational skills, memory skills, uh, critical thinking, organization and of thoughts and the data because they have to organize their page um, when they journal. Um, it also improves students achievement across curricular. As you'll see uh, during the presentation, nature journaling is naturally cross curricular. Um, it helps build new neural pathways, of course, because students are like invested and engaged and they're learning a lot. So their brain is developing uh, neural pathways. Um, it improves literacy skills. And I think this has a lot to do with the, the joy of writing and also understanding the purpose of writing, you know, to collect information in, and then after maybe reading to search more information on something they were really curious about. Um, there are also a lot of environmental effects of nature journaling, so I think that's really important in our uh, in our world today <laughs> to have an enhanced nature connection. Uh, I really like the second one: increased likelihood that students will become adults who spend time outdoor. I mean, we're so stuck on our screens today. <laughs> we need to, you know, have opportunities to learn how to do other stuff and be interested by other stuff than, than, than screens <laughs> and, and the nature can really do that. Um, engagement in sustainable practices, stronger sense of responsibility for their communities and increased empathy for the natural world and what we love we protect. So I think that's a really strong one. We also have a lot of physiological effects of nature journaling like reduced stress and anxiety, uh, slowing down the pace of life and boy do we need that <laughs> I mean I think that applies uh, for both the students and the teachers when we do nature journaling it suits everybody uh, down like a, a lot of the teachers I work with actually tell me that they feel more energized after going on outdoor activities with their students um, it also enhances a sense of awe and wonder um, uh, builds an inclusive culture. I really find that uh, when we go in nature, it's naturally inclusive because students can participate at their level. And then it also increases mindfulness. Lots of benefits, as you can see. So nature journaling is also uh, naturally student-centered and cross-curricular. Um, as you go in nature, you ask your students to find something they're interested about and journal about it. So it really follows their interest. And when they're interested in something, it fosters their curiosity, their engagement in their learning, and even a sense of responsibility towards what they want to learn about. Um, and for some of the, the students, you might notice that they actually will bring that home and, and do some more research about it because they're so curious and it will open up a whole world of possibilities for them. Um, 
and then it's cross-curricular as you'll see uh, later we can target a lot of learning goals and it, it actually targets them naturally like in the language math science history social emotional uh, domains it's really cross-curricular <laughs> holistic learning um of course i wanted to touch base a little bit more on language and literacy because that's my area of expertise um I mean, I've been doing nature journaling with students from pre-K to sec five. So that's quite a range <laughs> and, and they all benefit from it. And they all, you know, work at their level. So when we're doing it with the, the pre-K students, they don't have a lot of written language, of course. Um, so they might not even use any words in their <laughs> journals and that's okay. But then we can have the sharing periods where they have to they still have to organize their thoughts and, uh, you know, like choose their vocabulary, uh, make sentences orally to be able to share what they wondered about, what they were interested about, what they saw, what they heard. And it can be really cool and fun discussions, but also it, uh, it, it, it makes them, it gives them the often the desire to share what they what they saw some some students are really shy in the classroom and then suddenly they go outside and they see something that they're amazed about and they're gonna start like talking and and you'll see that the language is is uh, in more quantity and more quality when we uh, when we do that of course written language uh, when they write in their journal uh, we work naturally on, on written language. And I think um, really the biggest benefits are when we keep the journal a free space for the students. So we're going to talk even more about that later, but um, give them the freedom to write about what they want, to write as much or as little as they want, and to write even if they make mistakes. So we're not focusing on the spelling mistakes or the, like, you know, the sentence structure. We can do that after. We're going to talk about, about it more later. But uh, this is not the focus of, of the nature journaling. And all of this uh, will promote the, the love of writing, in my opinion. <laughs> And also another level of language that we're working on uh, naturally, of course, is the whole aspect of language for thinking and learning. It's really, really rich. So now we're going to go into the core of the presentation, uh, nature journaling in action. And here I have a picture of um, a little boy journaling, and he's actually journaled journaling about a, a shelter that he built and he's journaling inside the shelter that's why like the light is kind of orangey on the on the clipboard so uh of course he's not journaling about a natural element but it's it's still you know how to survive in nature so we build this shelter and then he after he shared about like how we built it to, to make sure like that the wind didn't come through and so he shared more orally than than written it was his first time nature journaling so <laughs> It, it takes time, of course, to improve when you do that. Um, so now I'm going to share my experience of how I like to do it. Um, but of course, that's just one example. And you will need to find your own routine, your own ways to do it according to your reality, according to your level of comfort to be outside with your students, uh, the learning goals you want to work on, uh, the length of time that you have, the weather, <laughs> etc. So I've been working from with students from pre-K to sec five and uh, I've really seen benefits from them all as I said before. What I like to do is start with a pre-activity in the classroom. So maybe the day before I do a, a pre-activity um, I am a speech language pathologist, so I like to <laughs> work with books. So often I'm going to bring a storybook um, and I'm, we're going to read about it. I, I tend to choose a book um, based on the topics that I want them to explore more. So if I want to, them to focus more on animal tracks and signs, and I'm going to take a book with animals in it, or if I want to talk more about, I want them to explore more about trees and, you know, I'm going to take a story with uh, that's more about trees. 
Um, and then we can, you know, pre-teach vocabulary. Uh, we can get them excited to go outside. And then they're, they have better chances to be dressed also for the weather the next day. <laughs> they're excited about it. Um, and then uh, the next day I go on um, the actual outing. Um, of course, I'm I'm working in Cree communities, so when I go out, I always invite um, a Cree elder or knowledge keeper to share their knowledge about nature. So I usually start with a nature walk. Sometimes even I start with um, the elders say, telling a story um, before entering the forest, and then we have a nature walk, and the elder shares their knowledge about the nature. But if you don't have access to, you know, an elder or an expert on nature, you can still do a nature walk and you don't need to know a lot about nature because the goal is for you to learn along with your students. So you don't need really any expertise. <laughs> what I like to do when I go on nature walk is um, model how to be curious. So we're starting and I, I tell them, okay, we're going to look around for things that, you know, we're curious about. And then we start walking and I look around and then I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, come here. And they're all going to gather. Look at this. I found a hole. I wonder which animal lives here. And then we're going to talk about it. They're going to ask questions. They're going to give me their hypothesis, their hypotheses. You know, we're going to make up stories and, <laughs> and then we're going to start working again and a lot of them are going to search for holes right so then i'm going to stop a few minutes later and then i'm going to say oh my gosh come here i saw something really weird on that tree and then i'm going to talk about <laughs> the tree gum and it's just going to expand their ways of looking or maybe i'm going to you know decide to focus on sound so oh i hear something can, can you hear it so it really broadened their, their, their perspectives on how to listen to nature, to look at nature, to be in nature. Um, and then they're going to call me <laughs> for things that they find. And this is a really a, a really neat way to have a, a nature walk, to have them moving. And after the nature walk, now they're, they're naturally in exploration mode. So I'm going to give them usually a, a little bit of free exploration time so they can just go around. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I tell them you can pick uh, an item that uh, you'd like to journal about later uh, without hurting nature, of course. <laughs> so they can gather one or two items and bring them back in their pockets. And then after we're having the nature journaling session. So what I like to do, especially at the beginnings when we're starting and they haven't had a lot of experience uh, with nature journaling, I like to sit in a circle and then I start nature journaling along with them so they see, you know, what I'm doing. And sometimes I share my page halfway just to, to show them. And then I'm going to stop and I'm going to go around and see what they're doing and I'm going to maybe... Um, uh, prompt them with questions uh, to bring their their thoughts uh, further while they are at nature drilling. And then we have the sharing circle. Uh, if it's not too cold, <laughs> if, if it's too cold, we can, you know, just come back in the classroom and have the sharing period in the classroom. You really have to adapt according to the weather, of course. Um, but then I also like to have a follow-up activity uh, inside. So it could be the, the next day. And uh, that could <laughs> go in any direction. Uh, but, you know, like try to find uh, one of your, the, the, the interest that was more, like, for example, if you found a hot, lots, lots of holes that day. So maybe you're going to decide to go in the library and uh, try to learn more about uh, animal habitats. And then like they have to, pick books and find information and maybe it, it leads up to an oral presentation or written text informative text or you know like you can derive a lot of uh, uh, learning activities that you actually need to do in your classrooms but based on a theme that they are really curious about so that's my way to do it <laughs> um now I'm going to jump uh, more into logistics. Um, the first thing is to select a location. I like to suggest to find a location that's easily accessible. Um, and it doesn't have to be far from the school. It could even be in the backyard if you have like 
a couple <laughs> trees and plants in the backyard that's that could be it uh, it could be just one block away just a little park even if you're in, a, in a, an urban area you can find nature all around you you can even find you know animal tracks like dog tracks cat tracks even maybe raccoon tracks <laughs> so it can be really anywhere um, one of the challenges that uh, some teachers have uh, concern the constant forms. So what I really like to suggest is <laughs> to pick a time that like you're going to go, if you're going to do that regularly, especially, it's nice to have a yearly consent form. Of course, you have to check with your school administrators to make sure that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, within the, the, the regulations of your schools, but like it may, uh, have it approved by your uh, school administrators. But having a, a yearly consent form, especially if you're going always on the same day and always on the same place, then it's easy to have this consent form. Parents know what their, where their child is going. And um, yeah, it's really easy. If you plan on moving locations, Sometimes uh, school administrators uh, can approve to have like um, a more general letter without a specific location, as long as you send uh, a message every week or two weeks, whatever your, <laughs> uh, your, your schedule allows to go. But um, and then, so the parents are informed. <laughs> where the, as long as the parents know where their child is, I guess. But uh, make sure that this is all also good with your school administrators. The length of um, nature journaling periods. So I told you I go like for half days when I go outside with the students, but sometimes you don't have that kind of time to go out. So I've also done it in a 45 minutes period of time. Of course, you have to be really prepared. Um, the location needs to be really close to if you are going to have only 45 minutes, you know, to get dressed, go on location, do the activity, come back. Um, but if you do it regularly, you're going to be, your group is going to become more efficient at going, you know, at doing all these steps. It's going to be get easier. Um, what I recommend is to have at least two periods. That's like, I find that's the uh, uh, length of time that's uh, long enough so you're not all rushed <laughs> to go nature journaling. And as uh, we were uh, seeing at the beginning, uh, the slowing the pace <laughs> of life is one of the benefits. So if you're going all rushed all the time, you, know, like, you lose that benefit. So having two periods, I find, is enough time to like have a bit of exploration time and then uh, they can move a little bit before sitting down in nature journaling, and then you can come back. Regularity. So if you go back often, as I said before, it's going to be easier for your students to be organized, to know what to bring, to know how to get dressed, um, and to like where they're going. It's got everything's going to become more efficient. Um, and you'll see also that the the nature journal pages will improve in all the the richness of the information that they're going to put in there and like how they organize information it's really going to improve number of students um, in the project that i'm working on we've done a lot of land-based activities uh it didn't always involve nature journaling so i've been on the land with as much as I think over 80 students <laughs> together. Of course, I was not alone. The teachers were, were there and we had like other people with us, um, but it's possible. However, when you go nature journaling, you want to sort of have like quietness. <laughs> so if if you decide to go with another classroom, that's that's great. Like you could do the nature walk together, some exploration time together or moving or a game, whatever like you want to do before. But then when it's time to nature journal, um, what I like to do is split, split the groups and then you can like go in different areas. So like you, you, you have a nice quiet time with your groups and uh, yeah, it's, it's more like a bubble. <laughs> they can really focus on their nature journal. Uh, so co-teaching uh, is, is a possibility. So um, if you want to, you know, pair up with another teacher, sometimes it's easier to organize things and it's like you can uh, 
you can split the prep time <laughs> so it gets easier for everyone uh, and that's it's a real possibility and uh yeah when you go out you just have to make sure you have the correct safety ratio so you have to look it up with your school administrators because they're different from schools to school um if only the two teachers are not sufficient. Maybe you can, you know, invite an educator or a parent or family members to join in. Um, that's always things that are possible. But check with your school administration what's possible. Materials. So for the materials, I would suggest to keep it simple. Uh, use what the students have. The basic that you need is paper a pencil and an eraser and a hard surface to write on. It could be just like a hard book, uh, but like I prefer to have clipboards because books can get, you know, wet and dirty from the <laughs> from the nature. So I, I do suggest to have a clipboard in instead. They're really cheap if you go to the dollar store <laughs> to buy. Um, another nice addition to have is our sitting pads. Uh, what I like to use are, on the picture, you see the, the, the yellow puzzle foam thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you can make a, a floor mat with those things uh, when you put all the puzzle pieces together. They're really cheap also at the dollar store. And what I do, I usually could cut them in half. So I have twice the, <laughs> the number of sitting pads. And because they're foam, they're really good insulation for winter as well. So in this in the spring and fall they they are protecting from the rain and wet <laughs> and mud but in the winter they're really uh, helpful for the keeping the heat under the bum you can also add other things um, like measuring tapes rulers or strings if you want your students to measure then they need to have some kind of tools um, magnifying glass and binoculars can be really helpful for some students who are not uh, engage that first and then you give them like a magnifying glass and suddenly everything's really interesting <laughs> so that's that can be just like a mot motivator um you can bring weather measuring tools as, if that's something that you want to your students to learn about scales uh scissors and glue glue in winter is not so good but fall and spring is good uh some containers or ziploc bag to collect stuff sometimes you can decide to you know collect a lot of pine cones and then do uh, another activities uh when you're back in class with the pine cones that they collected like an art activity or it could be math ma manipulatives um and then tweezers so they feel like more scientific <laughs> Uh, in winter, I recommend if you want to bring, uh, you know, colored pencils, uh, don't bring markers because the markers are going to freeze. So make sure that your tool, your tools in the winter won't freeze. Um, safety. So the first thing that uh, usually <laughs> teachers are afraid uh, and I was afraid at first about it was the the boundaries like oh my gosh I'm gonna lose all, all my students if I go in the <laughs> in the woods so uh, you you need to like put your boundaries and feel that to make you feel <laughs> more comfortable and then just also for students to know where they're allowed to go um so you can use uh physical boundaries like here it was the lake and then we had a road on the other side so it was really simple in this area because uh the, the land had uh actual boundaries uh but you can also use uh marking tapes fluorescent tape uh you know that people use for hunting <laughs> and uh have actually been outside you know with these groups of 80 90 students and um we we marked a whole area with uh, marking tapes of course not surrounding it but just like tying knots around some trees and they all respected the 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 boundaries because it was really clear where they were allowed to explore and the, it was quite big so they had <laughs> quite a bit of space to explore so they still they still felt the freedom you know i have few and simple rules and try to make it visual that's my speech language pathology background speaking but like having visual rule it, it helps uh, everyone remembering it them um i actually have four rules when we go uh, on the land the first rule is 
you always have to see an adult or the teacher. So you can't go so far that you can't see an adult. Um, if we call you, you have to come back. Uh, we keep the land uh, clean so we don't litter. And then what's the other one? Oh, always think about is what I'm doing safe? So this is one of the rules. And this is actually something that um, really helps with uh, discipline. So you, you don't want to go out in nature and always be like, don't go there, don't do that, don't do that. Because then the students are going to feel really stressed. So another way to manage <laughs> that is uh, to ask them to monitor their own safety. So by asking them questions, of course, you're going to be there to monitor as well, but uh, you can ask them, you know, oh, is what are you're climbing up the tree? Do you think that's safe enough for you to go down safely? Um, or, oh, I don't feel you can climb that tree, but only up to my height then you have to go down. So you give them a limit, but they still have some kind of freedom. Uh, if you wanna learn more about uh, these kinds of things, you can research risky play um, on the internet and you'll you'll see a lot of, uh, of um, nice uh, information about it. It's like risky play is, is any play that involves some kind of and frisk and it's usually not as risky as we think it is <laughs> and it actually has a lot of benefits it teaches students to to be safe for themselves so it's a really good uh, life learning skill and of course dress for the weather um, when you go nature drilling in winter your students are going to need small gloves under their big mittens because otherwise their their hands are going to freeze uh, too fast um, and also dress in layers so during the moving parts, they can take off some of the layers. But when they stop, uh, they need to have like big uh, layers because when we don't move, we get colder faster. So that's also a good learning. You know, at first you can have shorter sessions, uh, journaling sessions. So they learn how to deal with how to deal with uh, how to dress in the weather. And uh, it's actually a good life skill also to have. The power of routine. So I, I mentioned it before, if you go nature drilling often, the students will know what to expect. Everything's gonna become more efficient. Their nature drilling pages are gonna become more rich. Um, what I like to do also is use visual schedules and timers. Uh, this is just an example of one visual schedule I make. Um, it's just a sheet of paper in, in, inside a, a plastic protector and I use a, an erasable marker to, um, to, to write on it. Uh, so it's easy to make changes. Now I left the marker in the, in the bag, but usually I would put it in my coat because otherwise it would freeze. <laughs> but it's easy, you know, to pin on a tree and uh, especially you could move it closer to students who uh, have more difficulties with transitions. Uh, same with the timer, you could use your phone uh, or a time timer and you know put it close to the kids that need them more. Uh, I always recommend also in your routine to add movement first. So before the nature journal, have them move, like let them uh, move in nature because it's going to help them self-regulate, let out the energy, and then they will be prepared to learn and to focus more on their nature journaling after. Um, and if possible, allow time for freedom, for free play, for exploration. I mean, this has a lot of benefits. <laughs> also, if you want to read more about it, I could do a whole presentation about free play. <laughs> But that's not the topic of today. But I do recommend including it. It's it's really beneficial for your students. Okay, learning goals. So when you are setting learning goals, try to focus more on competencies rather than content. So the content is going to be selected by the students. Do they want to focus on pine cones, on squirrels, on trees, on animals, whatever, right? Like they're going to choose the content they're going to learn, but you can decide um, on some specific learning goals, like competencies. Like, oh, today we're going to focus on collecting data. So they can collect data on trees or on pine cones or on squirrels, whatever they want. But it, like, you know, they're still working on 
a competency. Or it could be about making hypotheses, forming letters. We're going to see more later. <laughs> That's, these are just some little examples. Uh, do leave space for freedom. So like, as I said, like let them choose what they're interested about uh, so they can journal about what they're really interested about in their journals. So you can also decide to make a plan and um, but it's good to <laughs> have the flexibility to ditch the plan if it if it's necessary. So sometimes you think you're gonna do something or you think, oh, today we're gonna focus on tree. You had your whole pre-activity, like book reading on trees, and then you go outside, but suddenly there's there's a squirrel, there's always a squirrel. <laughs> I should say that and the squirrel is going to steal the show and the students are so you know interested about it so how can you switch your learning goals to focus on the squirrel instead of you know the tree specific things or like maybe you link the trees with the squirrel because the squirrel lives on a tree right but try to sort of adapt to the student's interest uh, when you do that this the learnings uh, are often more powerful for your students because it's really rooted in something that uh, they, they, they got amazed about. Uh, when you give instructions for students, when you go nature journaling, um, I, I really give few, <laughs> few instructions. So one of them is in your journal, try to include words, drawings, and numbers. And then I also tell them you don't need to be good at drawing, you don't need to be good at writing, you don't need to be good at numbers. In your journal, in your journal, what I want to see is your thoughts, your thinking process, what you observed, what you wondered about, uh, what are your hypotheses to your questions, what did you think, what did you feel? That's what I want to see. That's what's important in your journal page. So some students <laughs> might. Uh, you know, after 30 seconds, be done. <laughs> and then you want to encourage them to journal a little longer. So what I like to do in these cases, is give them a little prompt. So you go see them. Oh, okay. So like you look at their journal page. Okay. What else can you see or hear or smell or feel? And they're going to answer you and you can say, okay, now write, write it in your page. <laughs> and then a little later you come back and you ask another question. So these are just some kinds of questions that you can ask them and then ask them to write it or draw it in their journals. So what else do you wonder? How would you explain this? How can you find the answers to your questions? Can you collect data to support your hypotheses? All, the, all those kinds of questions that can just like bring them forwards um, in their nature journaling. And feedback. There's a lot of information on that page <laughs> because I feel it's a really important part um, of nature journaling. That's that's uh, when you know you can bring them further in their in their process, uh, in their learning process, in their thinking process, and everything. That's during the feedback and the sharing periods. Um, with and and I need and what I want to keep in mind when I do when I give feedback is that nature journals should be a space where students feel free to express their thoughts. So you really want to provide positive feedback only. You don't want to like be critical about their journal page. You want to just highlight the elements that you want to see more. So for example, on that page that students was really interested about measures i see like he wrote only one word maybe i would like to see more words next time so i would say i would tell him oh i saw that you wrote like this this little thing this is a mosquito i thought it was a fly so a good thing you wrote it down because i wouldn't have known so then uh, it might encourage them for the next time to write uh to label more of the things that they are uh, drawing on that page um Focus on the elements. Like when you gave the instructions, you you told them that it's not important to be good at drawing and writing. So you you want to make sure you also reflect that in your comments. So if you're like giving feedback to a student about, oh my gosh, your drawing is so beautiful. And like, of course, it's a nice thing to say, but then other students who are not that good at drawing and they know it, they might feel like, ugh, like, 
I'm not good at drawing. I'm not, I'm never going to get like, you know, good feedback about it. So I'm going to stop drawing altogether. I'm not going to put efforts into it. But then if you, instead of that, like you, you make a comment about like, for example, that mosquito. Well, I like that you put like all the three parts of the mosquito. So you talk about the details of the drawing or what information the drawing gives you, then it's going to encourage them to observe further next time and even put more detail into their drawings. So then you really encourage the, the drawing process and um, the learning process rather than the talent. Uh, you could also focus on page organization or like any other elements that you want to see happen more. When you give group feedback, so sometimes it's nice to take a journal and show to the other students. So sometimes you often don't have time to do that with every journal. So some say, okay, today we have time for three journals. I'm going to give feedback on. And then you, you pick three and then you uh, give the same kind of feedback that we discussed about uh, out loud to all the groups. So try to pick things that you want to see more in the others journals. For, for example, um, this particular student here has organized his page um, and all the other students did not. So maybe I would take that journal and, and, and just talk about, oh, look at what's interesting about this journal is, uh, you know, it has different boxes. So it really draws my attention to the different elements of what he looked at. Um, I really can see like which measurements go with which uh, drawing and that makes it really easy for me to understand. So then the other students next time might decide to make boxes uh, on their own journals. Um, when you do that, try to, you know, when you do a group feedback, try to every time select three different students. Uh, so everyone gets positive feedback eventually on their journals. Another thing I like to do is if, you know, like for example, this student, he wrote mosquito in quite an odd way. Uh, I would like him to know how it's written, like what's the, the correct spelling. So instead of taking a red marker and, you know, like making his page, <laughs> like, you know, altering his page where he's supposed to be free to write, maybe I would just put a post-it with the right spelling. It, he doesn't have to correct it, but every time he's going to turn to this page, he's going to see the correct spelling. Uh, another thing that you could do is list all the words um, that you saw that were misspelled in all the journals and make a list, a vocabulary spelling list that you, they're going to have to learn later. Uh, so it's not directly in their journal, but they are still learning the correct spelling. Um, yeah, I think that's about what I wanted to share on this page. Okay, we're already at the sharing period. Um, so I don't know if we have a lot of people in the room, uh, but I would like to know, I don't know if you could share in the chat or if you're comfortable sharing in the video, but which of your current learning goals that you're working at with your students in your classroom, do you think you could link with nature generally? Well, I, I, I definitely have one. Um, we've been playing around with these little uh, microcontrollers, uh, Cillian, and yeah. um, we can create tools with them, right? So compasses, thermometers. So I love this idea of doing it before. So programming our tool and then going outside with it to gather yes. data that's that's around them and then journaling that data. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that um, would be amazing. They have their own tool, their own data, and it's like <laughs> the conversion. But I love those. I love like that they have the, the measuring tape um, where they can start to measure and kind of get an idea and then gathering all that. I had one question though, like are, are students allowed to say they found a really cool leaf or like, can they include that in their journal? Like, can they post things or is it usually you tend to keep away from like it being a, a gathering place for like things they find out in nature? I like to keep it free, <laughs> but that's my own opinion. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, if they glue the thing on their paper, I encourage them to try to draw it on the side just because it's going to help them uh, develop their observational skills. 
Um, so yeah, but there's a lot of things that they won't be able to glue on in their journals. So even if they glue some some of the stuff, um, other things they won't be able to glue. So they will have to to draw it anyway. Amazing. Yeah. Anyone else would like to share about their learning goals in their classrooms that you could link? I see a Ray. Yeah, not Kristen. Yes. Um. Can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, just to piggyback on the, what you were saying earlier about the can we pick it up or do we leave it there? The last time I participated in an activity like that, um, well, we had to follow the uh, leave no trace principle. Yeah. So the students are not allowed to uh, take anything, even if they wanted to. It was uh, the 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 person uh, who was leading the activity said, well, we need to leave it there for the next person who's going to come in the forest and see it and all that. So even if there was a little, like, for example, my daughter found a, a little fossil behind a rock, you know, so she said, no, we're going to leave it there. But um, one of the things that I was aiming, uh, uh, one of the learning goal would be um, something about exploring the, the sensory, uh, sensory needs, the, 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 developing a little bit more their self-awareness or the portrait of what they like what they don't like with the sensory aspects of uh, of nature so this is something we, it, that is more difficult to do inside the classroom so i was thinking to uh, to go that uh, path yeah yeah, uh, definitely. Even uh, in one of the groups I was in, there was a, a student who naturally was uh, really interested in the textures. So what she journaled about was all the different textures. So she she drew like a bark and then like she wrote about the texture of that bark and then like a leaf that was really soft. And like, so she wrote about all kinds of different textures. So that that's actually a, gro a great um uh, activity and then you can learn all the vocabulary linked to these textures uh yeah that's uh yeah sensory i mean all that your senses are uh alert when you go in nature so that's a great great learning goal yeah thank you for sharing anyone else would like to share okay so i'm gonna move on <laughs> Uh, I do, I did list some of the goals that could, well, that are often naturally um, targeted when you go nature journaling, uh, but that you could also decide to uh, focus on. So by just like inviting your students, okay, remember yesterday we saw, uh, we learned, uh, I don't know, five new vocabulary words about nature. So today in your journal, I'd like you to use at least one or two, you know, new vocabulary words or invite them to, depending at which level they are, like if they're in <laughs> kindergarten, okay, I'd like you to include one letter or if they're, you know, in the, in higher grades, you can ask them to write a full sentence or a comparative sentence you have like a specific sense, uh, sentence structure that you want them to include in their journal but their sentence is going to be based on what interests them right uh, you could ask them to formulate a questions you could even pick a, a like a wah uh, question word that you want specific that you want them to include in your in their journal page or uh like focusing on expressing thoughts and feelings uh, using writing to construct meanings could be done by uh asking them asking them to um, making a hypothesis about something uh, that they wondered about, uh, asking them to create a little poem. It could be just like a haiku, right? It doesn't have to be long um, or like a, a poetry figure, you know, <laughs> that they have to include in their, in their writing. Or um, you could also bring books with you reference books where like during the journal sessions the books are available around and they can they have to search one thing about one thing that they wondered about um and then write one information from that book in their in their journals um i even have a colleague she was working in kindergarten level and she decided to make a progression of writing for her students to self-evaluate themselves so 
kindergarten, right? So she started with level one, one star was, uh, you know, you put a dot or a line. <laughs> that's it. Like, that's a very simple thing. Second step, two stars was uh, you put, you, you did a drawing. Third star was uh, like three stars were, was a drawing plus a letter. And then four stars were, was um, a whole word and a drawing in kindergarten. And then she would, you know, change this progression of writing based on her students' productions. So maybe after two months, she would change this progression. So none of the students would do uh, dots or lines anymore so she would you know scrap this and then she would like add an, uh, another extra level uh, to to that progression of, of writing and you could do that also uh, with higher grades you just have to make your progression of writing more complex and I like the fact that she was using actual samples from her students because then it really gives a visual example of what it looks like and then students can self-evaluate what they did that day and they can move in between levels that's fine it just like gives them an idea of what they actually included in their journal uh so maths lots of things can be worked in, on uh estimations measure so that that particular students uh decided to measure the mushroom she picked um geometry there's so much geometry in nature um, if you collect data, they can make graphs and tables in their on their journal pages. Um, you could even like pre-teach a certain type of graph or some, a certain type of table. And then, you know, when you go in nature, then they have to sort of make one graph about something they, they're interested about. You could also gather statistics, make probabilities, that, like the possibilities are endless. <laughs> uh, have a couple goals in science. Of course, um, I mean, the whole nature journaling process I find is uh, really similar to the inquiry process because students are observing what's around them. They're making observations. They're asking themselves question, questions and they're making hypotheses or predictions. They try to problem solve how to get their answers. And then, uh, you know, they share about things uh, in sometimes graphs or like they have to present the information. So it's like really a whole inquiry process is included in the nature journaling process if you really uh, guide it pro properly, I would say. Like if you just look at this uh, journal page from a student, uh, she was, she drew this like weird green leafy mushroomy thing, <laughs> you know, she wrote mushroom disguised as a leaf and we found out after it's actually a lichen but it really did look like a leaf on top but like a mushroom under and then she drew the roots but she also drew another plants uh, that also have roots so now she could explore like the the purpose of roots and you know the connection also between uh these living organisms with their environments um we also, of course, saw a squirrel that day, <laughs> so she journaled about it too. Squirrels are very popular. Okay, so before I end, I just want to also um, share some resources. There's this book available for free as a PDF online. I mean, I, I recommend making them a donation <laughs> if you download it. But it's a great tool. There's a lot of lesson plans uh, for nature journaling. So if you don't know where to start uh, and you need more structure, then like they have really structured activities uh, in that book. You can buy the paper copy or download it for free as a PDF. Uh, if you Google the title and then the uh, the name of the author you will find actually John Muir Laws is one of uh is a an expert in nature journaling as an educational tool so you'll find a lot of resources on his website um I also like uh picture books um the 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 two on the left so the nature journal and the hike are two books that I like because in the stories um the the students are actually um, taking, uh, having a, a nature journal. So you see pages of different ways to um, note things in the nature journals uh, in both of those books. Um, 
and then you can also have like I just put two books about one about trees and one about um, animal tracks but there's there are so many of them you can find if you just have to google a little bit you'll find a lot of of, uh, of reference books that you can you know leave in the classroom as a station um, you can bring with you when you go uh, on the land you can you know bring a nice tarp um, plastic tarp you put the books on them so there's they stay protected and then students can go consult them uh, when they need to um, I also wanted to uh, share uh, well this is just one of the documents but you can you can download a lot of resources from the child and uh, alliance Child and Nature Alliance of Canada website. So this particular document is how to work with challenging behaviors, um, but they have a lot of resources also. I would really recommend to visit their website if you're planning on doing any nature activity. Well, I wanna thank you um, again. This was amazing. Um, wow, so much great information and and um, amazing practice as well. I mean, you're just a, I can see through all of what you presented that, uh, anybody would love to go on a nature walk with you. So yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> really, uh, outstanding information. Um, and from the heart, which also connects with us as well. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to come spend an hour with us today and tell us a little bit about nature journaling. It's so fascinating. I, I, I want to do it now. <laughs>